doing this? Welcome to the football. <laughs> Welcome to the football film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is uh, Reverend Steve, founder of the Church of Ed Wood, which uh, has been going, going since 1996, which is a really long time for a religion based on Ed Wood that everyone assumed was a joke. So it's still around, and I should get some sort of credit for that, at least like a pat on the back or a kid's karate trophy or something, because it's still around, and that's, that's well, don't pretty you, big. Don't, don't you have the Flying Pig Award or something like that? Yeah, I have some sort of an award like that, like one or two bizarre internet awards and nothing that any other website couldn't get. Yeah. But, yeah. Edward.org, you should check that out. Oh, most definitely. Yes. A lot of good oh. wood and things to learn. Hmm? I am so happy that the holidays are over. Yeah. I'm just so happy that that's just all done and I just don't have to worry about the holidays. I still have to, you know, it, I'm just so happy that that's the Christmas. Don't have to worry about that. Don't have to think about that. That's done. I'm so happy that Christmas is now dead. <laughs> being being here in Oklahoma, I have a lot of people that will come up to me and they'll say Merry Christmas, and they'll and they're not telling me Merry Christmas. It's a test, and yeah. they want to hear me say Merry Christmas back. Because if I say happy holidays, then they'll go ape shit on me. Oh, God. Once I, I did say, like, happy holidays. Well, why did you say that? Well, because I'm actually a part of a war on Christmas. It's all a big liberal conspiracy. I'm working with Obama. We're going to take everybody's guns. <laughs> and... Thankfully, the woman laughs and just, oh, look at you. You're so funny. Anyway, Merry Christmas, and kept walking. But, yeah, Christmas in Oklahoma, it's, uh, it's different. Yeah, yeah. I had not run across too much on the war on Christmas this year. I think all the police shooting <laughs> over yeah. it a little, you know. Um, but, you know, see, I used to say Merry Christmas because that's how I was raised. And I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, it means the same to me as Happy Holidays or Season's Greetings or anything like that. Um, so I just say Merry Christmas. Um, yeah. And sometimes you'll get, you'll get like, douche waffles from the other side, too. You know, like, say Merry Christmas to them, and it's like, oh, you're one of them. Uh, I'm not one of them. Yeah. I just said these words. You say yeah. whatever words back. And there were a couple of posts from Facebook of uh, people on my friends list who put up some shit about the war on Christmas. It's just a strange trend when it comes to this. Yeah. You know? And like people, like, you kind of know them and they put up stuff like that. It's like, no, no, tell me. They sort of posted back, like, Tell me, tell me exactly where this war is. What is happening exactly? Where's the problem? You know? Yeah. So I got to, I got to a few of those. Uh, but that was about it, because, because nobody could say what the war on Christmas exactly is. Oh, you don't get the nativity scene in, in my government building? Well, you're sorry. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and this is not but it's a, it's a, the war on Christmas is a real thing over here because there are just so many old people and Christians and Republicans and gun fanatics that oh they're convinced that it's a real thing and it's ooh it's bad it's 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 really bad so I decided that this year I was going to actually start a war on Christmas. But then, unfortunately, and, Kurt Cameron came along and stopped the war. Yes. So that was sad. 
So it's all it's all over. It's all over. Yeah, it's all over. Kurt Cameron won. Kurt Cameron won it for Jesus. So. And please, man, if I wish you a Merry Christmas, wish me a Happy Hanukkah. Okay, please, please. Because I would, I would be like, all right, where can I get a fucking finish in this town? Where are they keeping all the half sour pickles? You know where they are. <laughs> yeah. Because a lot of my life, in one way or the other, I was raised around a lot of Jewish culture. You know. So really? You know, I could, yeah, so there were like a lot of Jewish food that <laughs> we would just eat from time to time because they were good. And yeah. it's hard to find them out in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine so, yeah. You know, a knish <sighs> is like a potato hot pot. Nice. Okay. That's they, good. They, That's a really they, good analogy. They take mashed potatoes and then they bread that and fry it. Hmm. And that's the finish. And they don't like really deep fry it. They just like fry it enough to cook. Like so when you bite into it, it's still mashed potatoes. Yeah. You know. Um. So what do you want to start with? Do you want to start with Inframan or do you want to start with the movie? Ultraman. It's Ultraman. 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 I was looking for You keep wanting to call it like Intraman or something like that. There's nothing well, in about it. It's Ultraman. Blame Mr. Lobo for that, man, because he's the one who's got Inframan on zombie TV. Yeah, okay. Yes, we will we will start with our homework. Because I assigned homework last week. And I assigned homework for one important reason. Because I honestly believe that every single solitary person in the, in the planet Earth should be sat down and forced to watch this one specific episode of Ultraman because it is the greatest and worst and strangest thing that's ever been made and put into a television show. And before we talk about it, I would like to take this time to say that sometimes you watch an episode of a television show and you go, oh, well, you know, I've never watched any other episodes. So, like, you can't just start with season 35 of Supernatural. And you can't yeah. just pick up, like, like a, a new episode of Doctor Who and fully understand everything. You can't, They show reruns of, like, the TV show Stargate. And you can't just watch one and understand it. So you say, oh, well, you know, maybe if I watch all the other episodes, I will understand it. That is not how this episode of Ultraman is. There is <laughs> nothing that you would understand from watching all of the Ultraman that would make this episode make more sense. Because this episode makes no sense, and that's what's so wonderful about it. I got Ultraman, and like, I knew of its existence, I knew that it, it was a very popular series of Japanese television shows and and that it was created by the, the same studio, the same people who created Godzilla. And I I knew that it was supposed to be campy and silly and fun and so I stumbled onto the show. There was a box set of the entire run of the original series Ultraman that was next to the registers at a Borders Books and Music in Sacramento, California, shortly before Borders went out of business. And I bought it for $5. <laughs> it's the entire run of the series. It's, it's 39 episodes. And I watched a couple of them, and I thought they were weird, and I just put them in storage, and I forgot about them. And then I had my son, Maxwell. And he started getting to be, you know, one year old and two years old. And I really decided that, you know what I'm going to do with, with my son? I'm going to throw everything at him and see if any of it sticks. So I'm going to throw uh, the original Frankenstein on him and the Wolfman, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Dracula, old uh, Lugosi movies. I'm going to throw uh, classic Looney Tunes at him, really old Sesame Streets and Schoolhouse Rock, and eventually he, there's going to be something that he really, really likes. So when yeah. he was young, he, he was obsessed with Godzilla movies, and he was he just he knew every monster, he knew every every bad guy, every good guy, he knew everything about Godzilla. And that's when I remembered that I had these 
this Ultraman box set that I never really watched, so I dusted it off and put it on for him, and that was pretty much his, the, the first two years of his life. He was obsessed with Ultraman. He was absolutely we watched every, we watched every episode, and yeah, he just, he absolutely loved it, and so, um, Ultraman, it, was shown on the Tokyo Broadcasting System in 1966. It's actually a spin-off of another show called Ultra Q, which is essentially Ultra Q was essentially essentially not essentially, but <laughs> Ultra Ultra Q was a bizarre science fiction Twilight Zone. Okay. In Japan. And every week they just have some bizarre science fiction story. And one of the episodes, which was about this alien called Ultraman, that really stuck with the Japanese public. And so Ultraman is a spinoff of Ultra Q. And the, the bizarre opening credit sequence where, where there's all these colors that are kind of rotating in the beginning of the show Ultraman, that is actually the opening of the original show Ultra Q, and then the name Ultraman explodes out of Ultra Q. So that's what that opening is. Ultraman was crazy popular, and that spawned a number of uh, spinoffs. After after Ultraman was Ultra 7, and then the return of Ultraman, and then Ultraman Ace, then Ultraman Taro, then Ultraman Leo, and then Ultraman 80s, and then a shit ton more. In fact, there are still brand new Ultraman TV shows that are appearing now on television, as well as a bunch of movies and comic books. And, yeah, last year, Ultraman got a, a Guinness world record for the most spin-off shows in really? history. Because, yeah, because they, they've just made so many. This first season of Ultraman, it was 39 episodes. It was about a, a year and a half of television, and they ended it, and it was so popular that they said, well, let's do that again. So they did another 40 episodes of Ultra 7, and then after that, they did 30 episodes of The Return of Ultraman, and then they just kept doing these tiny little seasons with yeah. different Ultraman and different characters, and and so, we, yeah, it, it's insanely popular. It's popular still to this day. There's a new Ultraman that's showing on Japanese television now, and it's, it's big graphics and big special effects and good plot lines and good acting and all this stuff. But the original is shit. But it's it's wonderful shit. <laughs> it's the same people who made Godzilla, but they, they they can't afford the sets that Godzilla did. They can't afford the, the actors, and it's just really cheap gold. In fact, there's one episode of the original Ultraman series in which they literally got an old Godzilla outfit. They spray-painted it, uh, I, I believe, silver. And they added gills to it, and they called it some weird monster. But it's literally just they got an old Godzilla suit and tried to make it look different. Because they had no budget for this show at all. So it's amazing well, I, that this... I love it's amazing that this low-budget show, low show somehow became popular. What were you saying? I love the monster in this one. And I'm really oh my god, this came one, but the monster was the monster was pretty fucking awesome. Just looking at those all the different parts he was made out of. Um, that that monster like makes absolutely of, no sense. The monster like makes no of, sense whatsoever. Some kind of hippie dog with uh, the claws from the robot from Lost in Space and and, and kind of radio antennas. <laughs> yeah. So this episode is episode 11. It's called The Ruffian from Outer Space on the DVD and in the American release. In in Japan, the title loosely translates to The Rascal from Outer Space. But anyway, 
in the beginning, so much huh? It's so much cuter. <laughs> the rascal from outer space. Yeah, because yeah, because a lot of times Ultraman is fighting these dangerous monsters, but there's absolutely no danger here. So basically, this episode. Oh, which I love. I just, I, I love every second of this episode. It's so wonderful and stupid. And literally, I just want to go around the world and just show it to everyone. Because it's just so fun and stupid and, and, and silly and makes no sense. And it, it's filled with plot holes. But it's just my absolute favorite episode of anything anywhere is this. And there are some really good episodes, and there are some really bad episodes of Ultraman, but this one is just the perfect explanation as to what's wonderful about Ultraman. So, in the beginning, a meteor falls on a group of Japanese kids playing bizarre, vaguely homoerotic games. Yeah. As one of Yeah, as they do. One of those kids is Hoshino. Hoshino is, uh, you know what, I should explain Ultraman. Uh, Ultraman is secretly Hayata. He's a member of the Science Patrol. Uh Uh-huh. I like the Science Patrol. He he had that shifty science look in his eye. He did. He did. He did. He's he's just, he's he's a bad guy because he believes in science, whereas I believe in G-shish. And evolution and shit. All yeah. that big bang. Yeah, why isn't there a religious patrol to be patrolling the science patrol? First Hammer's so, not doing anything. Yeah, that's a good point. In the first episode of Ultraman, a monster falls from it, 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 onto the planet Earth from space. And kind of a an intergalactic space cop called Ultraman follows him in his spaceship while Hayata is patrolling for the science patrol. The UFO containing Ultraman crashes into Hayata's spaceship, into Hayata's ship, and Hayata dies right in the beginning of the episode. Ultraman feels bad about this, so Ultraman gives Hayata, Ultraman gives Hayata his life. So Hayata comes back to life, and any time there's trouble, he can transform into Ultraman. Uh Uh-huh. And somehow, no one ever figures this out, despite the (laughs) glaring clues and stuff like that. It's a very Lois Lane, Clark Kent sort of a situation with... Oh, my God, yeah. ...the members of the Science Patrol. One of the members of the Science Patrol, because this is a Japanese TV show, all Japanese TV shows and movies has to have a young, precocious boy with shorts that are way too short. Yes. yes and so that's Hoshino. And Hoshino is playing in a field with uh, some kids, and he finds this magical stone, and the stone can turn into anything, like a piano made out of driftwood. Or a cake that I can't imagine tastes too good. <laughs> the the really bizarre the really bizarre part is when they're having the press conference about the meteor, and they have a reporter, you know, show how it works, and the reporter is told to to think about the one thing he always dreams of, and the stone turns into a Japanese bride. Yeah. <laughs> And so he takes the arm of the Japanese bride and walks down the aisle, but then the stone turns into a man? <laughs> it, it doesn't really... I think that that Japanese reporter has some issues that he needs to be honest with himself about. Maybe well, sit down and... Have like a heart to heart with Ellen or something because I think that there are some things that even he's not being honest with himself about. But now, now if in the next shot it was him in the bridal dress, then you have comedy gold. That's a good point. Comedy gold. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but then there's this strange crippled guy 
Okay, wait a second, wait a second. Though you got to answer me this one because yeah. it's killing me. The Japanese Science Foundation or whoever the hell they were. The Science Patrol. Yeah. Why do they all dress like matadors? I don't know, but I, I love their orange jumpsuits. Yeah. Those are wonderful orange jumpsuits that the Science Patrol has. Big fan of their orange jumpsuit. It reminds me of the sort of bizarre jumpsuit things that all the characters wear on the animated TV show Home Movies with Coach McGurk and Brendan. I used to be obsessed with that cartoon. They used to play on Adult Swim. And yeah. nobody ever wears shirts or pants. They're just wearing bizarre jumpsuits. So yeah. perhaps and that's the same you universe. Know. Let me tell you something, though, that's really kind of weird and I still find unexpected. In this day and age, it's hard to find jumpsuits. Yes. It's really fucking hard to find jumpsuits. You know, because yeah. when, you know, you know, in a few of my films, a few of my short films, I'm just like, oh, fuck, man, what are we going to do for costumes? Put them in jumpsuits. Goodwill! <laughs> Let's put them in jumpsuits. And it's hard to find goddamn jumpsuits. I got like three of them. I'm like collecting them. Hmm. I don't know so where I, I guess those. Contact us at openundoubtgals.com. Right, yes, or or hit up our Stitcher. Yes. <laughs> oh, I love our Stitcher. Oh, one day, one day, it is it is on such a long list of things to do in life. So this bizarre crippled guy steals the magical stone yes. by making it turn into a liquid and then into a rocket, and then the rocket flies into his car. The, the thing that, that that I'm a bit confused about is he he makes the wish via radio, <laughs> and, and I don't think that that would work, but far be it for me to, to question the creators of Ultraman. So, so yeah. he he's he's at some hotel and he he just says that he wants the stone to turn into a monster, and so the stone turns into the stupidest monster ever. Stupid or awesome? <laughs> it's it's the like the greatest thing of all time, and so there's a wacky montage where they're just going around the hotel scaring people. Yeah. And there's some creepy Japanese guy taking pictures of uh, Japanese women in bathing suits in the pool, which I imagine just happens all the time. <laughs> <clears throat> because Japan, Japanese website. And then, yeah. Yeah. then the guy wants the monster to turn into a giant monster, and so the monster turns into a giant monster and then also destroys the hotel with the guy inside, and the guy gets into a coma, but somehow the monster is still a giant monster. Although, despite the fact that we've already learned from Hoshino and his uh, his buddies in the short shorts gang, that you have to keep thinking about the thing in order for the stone to stay as it is. So now they're trying to wake this bizarre crippled guy up so that the monster will stop destroying everything. And then, of course, Hayata turns into Ultraman, but only after so many other things have tried. That's the thing that has pets me about Ultraman. And I guess it, a whole bunch of shows like this or in movies like this. Of course he has to turn into Hoshino. A, a, of course he has to turn into Ultraman at the end of the show. You can't have him turn into Ultraman at the beginning. You have to shoot things at him that won't work and have him destroy a bunch of property before you can actually do your job and turn into Ultraman and destroy the stupid monster. And it really is one of the worst... I was more wondering why exactly we were needing Ultraman at all, because it sounded like the kids and the doctor, they were on it. Let's wake this guy up, slap him around until he wishes his wish away, and the monster turns into a rock again. Yeah, yeah. They, Ultraman was not needed at all. 
Ultraman he was not needed all, at all. Ultraman could have been all photographs of the bikini girls. You Using know, the beta capsule, Hayata <laughs> transforms into <laughs> Ultraman. I was glad for that little explanation about who Ultraman was. Yeah. How he's Ultraman. I kind of like that. You know, you get a little bit of origin story going on there. Every once in a while during the fight, the monster would get the upper hand on Ultraman, and the monster would do this Andy Kaufman, I'm from Hollywood sort of thing, where he would point at his forehead as if to say, I have the brains. I'm from Hollywood. I am smarter than Jerry Lawler. I have the brains. I really liked that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't there know. Are, you know. Like a lot of the times that robot was trying, that, not the robot, the, the monster was trying to surrender. Yes, there were some times. Apparently the monster was scared of water because <laughs> that was a big, that was a big part of the episode. But literally this is, this is the best Ultraman. It, it's just, it's stupid, it's pointless. It makes no sense, but it's wonderful, and I honestly and sincerely believe that everyone should watch it, which is why I came up with the idea for this to be homework, because just everybody needs to watch this episode. This is a wonderful episode of a bizarre, bizarre show. And, you know, it, I spent $5 buying this stupid show on DVD, and it was the best $5 I've ever spent. I, I've watched every episode forwards and backwards and it's just great. It's a great show. It was a wonderful buy and you know, there are other Ultraman shows that are out there and some of them are really, really good and have special effects and they're made, they're cranking out movies now and they're really amazing movies but, oh man, this this Ultraman is just great. And if if you're interested so now, in, now, now, if you're interested in Ultraman kind of like the GoBots version of Ultraman? I don't know, but there are a bunch, there were a bunch of Ultraman imitators out there. Yeah. Ultraman was kind of the first show on Japanese television to kind of show people, hey, look, um, you know how these giant monster movies are really popular? Well, you can do this on TV too. And Ultraman was so popular that they started doing a bunch of other shows like that. There was a spin-off a series where Ultraman teamed up with, it, I'm, I'm going to mess up the name, but it, it's called like Common Rider or something like that. It's like this Japanese robot that rides a motorcycle. Okay. And they teamed up for a while. Um, but there were a bunch of rip-offs of Ultraman. And one of them, which I think is a great episode too, but it's kind of hard to find, um, Japanese Spider-Man. Have you ever seen Japanese Spider-Man? I have heard of Japanese Spider-Man. I have not seen it. Oh, I, I have the first couple of episodes, and I sometimes yeah. force my kids to watch them, and they just absolutely hate it. It's a <laughs> Japanese version of Spider-Man, and it really follows the comic book closely, except Peter Parker is now a Japanese motorcycle rider and stuntman who is given his Spider-Man powers by aliens. <laughs> okay. And so if exactly he wants like to the, turn the, in... Exactly like the legend, yeah. Uh, yeah, other than that, it's the exact comic book. And he, he's fighting all of these evil aliens from outer space and giant monsters. And if he wants to turn into Spider-Man, he, he has this magical bracelet and if he presses it, then suddenly he turns into Spider-Man. And just like in the comic book, Japanese Spider-Man can control a giant uh, samurai robot. Okay. Tall and can fly and can fight I, monsters. I remember those. I remember that happening all the time. People see the park and breaking out the giant robot. Yeah, the giant robot. It it is. Wonderful, they, they, they but the it, Sentinels. It, they were the Sentinels because Peter Parker was like yeah, really yeah. racist. You know, they just didn't come out in Toby Maguire. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Like the Sentinels. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> Ultraman is amazing, and if you want to watch any of the Ultramans, the entire Ultraman series is free to watch on Hulu. 
and on daily motion. You don't need a Hulu account to watch it. It's totally free because who cares? Because it's Ultraman, and it's wonderful. And it, I it, enjoyed it. it. I oh, enjoyed it's the it. it's I, the best. Everyone in the I, world should be forced to watch this episode. I, I really enjoyed seeing Toy Rockets again. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like There's the a. Lifted up. <laughs> my family and I have watched Ultraman so much that it's become like a Rocky Horror thing for us, where yeah. we'll start yelling out things to go with the show. In the first episode, they all think that Ultraman is dead. And so they all think that, uh, they all think that, what's the name? Hayata. They think that Hayata is dead. And right. so when they find out that Hayata is alive, Hayata is talking on the, in, on the radio. And so the captain, Captain Mura, radios oh, yeah. Hayata. And he goes, Mura to Hayata. Mura to Hayata. Where were you all throughout the night? And I, I always thought that that was a bit of an odd phrase to say. Where were you all throughout the night? Is not <laughs> the sort of thing you say to a coworker who you think is dead. So I like yeah. to, I like to continue that phrase. I go, Murder to Hayata, Murder to Hayata. Where were you all throughout the night? I missed your breath Mom, on the back of my neck. I, I was missed your scent. at the mall with my friends. Everybody I'm, else is allowed to do it. God. I missed your rugged arms holding me, Hayata. Holding me and telling me that everything is okay. I missed your scent, Hayata. I was so worried about you. I just held your pillow and kissed it and pretended that it was your face, Hayata. And then for some strange reason, my family has created this, like, Hoshino rap song. That yeah. we sing whenever Hoshino shows up and goes into one of his wacky hijinks. We just have this bizarre song, just Hoshino, Hoshino, oh, oh, Hoshino, and we start singing to Hoshino. I'm not sure why, but my family just all hates Ultraman, and they just absolutely hate it. But they can't stop watching it because it's amazing and jaw dropping and bizarre and infuriating and weird and beautiful. It's a wonderful show, and more people should be aware of it. More should, people certainly should, yes. It was a very uh, fun watch in that month, man. He just cracked me up in the battle. Oh, yeah. It was like a 60s hippie vest he had on. <laughs> like, where'd all those and it was, come from? <laughs> and it was barking. It kept... It, burf, burf, burf. <laughs> Making this sort of weird Yelp noise, which which doesn't instill fear, I think. Yeah, no. In, into the hearts of, I don't know, maybe the Japanese people, but it didn't to me. Well, I don't know. Anyway, they, I was, they seem to have found King Caesar's uh, laugh kind of scary, I guess. Ah, uh, yes, King Caesar. Yeah. I love King Caesar. I'm so I've happy. I've never seen him in a whole movie. Like, I've never seen he, whatever movie he originated in. Yeah. Uh, Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. Yeah. The 1960s. The first appearance of Robot Godzilla. That was when King Caesar first appeared. Aha, uh-huh, okay. And then he appeared again in the last Godzilla movie that they made, Godzilla Final Wars. Which yeah, is when all Final of Wars. the monsters appeared. Yeah. Yeah, I, I found Final Wars to be just a lot of fun. Did, Did you see that last Wars. Godzilla movie that they made, the the one that came out this past summer? Uh, yeah, not great, but I liked it. I, I didn't see I didn't see too much terrible to complain about. It's a fucking Godzilla I, movie. I, you know? I, I, yeah. I saw it, and I, I liked it. I loved it. I went nuts. I was so happy, and I was like, oh, that Matthew Broderick movie that was so shit, and now this movie is made up for those past sins, and and now it's, you know, it's such a good movie, and I love it. And so I got a, a copy of it, and I showed it to Maxwell, and, you know, like 20 minutes, a half hour into it, he was just playing with toys and running around the house, and I'm like, yeah, I 
kept trying to sit him down, and I was confused because he will sit down and watch any every Godzilla movie. He loves Godzilla movies, and he sits down, he watches every second of them, every frame, but here's this big American Godzilla movie, and he just would not stand for it at all. So I said, Maxwell, what's wrong? This is a Godzilla movie. Look, there's Godzilla, and Godzilla's there, and he's trampling stuff. And Maxwell just pointed at it and said, Daddy, that not real Godzilla. Yeah. And he went off and he played. And from that point on, I have looked at that movie completely different. Because of a, re- because of a review, a very honest review from a three-year-old child. Yeah. I now look at that movie differently. Yeah. It's a good movie. I- but it's not can, it's not a Godzilla movie. Yeah, I can I can understand that because like when I was young, things being real was like really important to me. You know? Yeah. Like Warner Brothers were like real cartoons and then everything was sort of like an off brand, you know. Frankenstein was, was Boris Karloff. All of that kind of stuff. So yeah. I, I I wrapped around real a lot. Like, that's not real. That's not yeah. really Frankenstein. That's fun, strange. You know, something like that. Now, the next Godzilla movie that America makes, that might be different, because they're adding a whole bunch of monsters to the next Godzilla movie. But unfortunately, yeah. we have to wait for a couple of Star Wars to come out before we get to see another Godzilla movie. Yeah. They are actually going to do another one? Cool. Yeah, the next one is going to have Mothra and Rodan and uh, Ghidra, the three-headed monster, in it. And they have have confirmed that. Is that an American production? Because I remember, I think I heard someplace that Toho was trying to put that a new one. Yeah, no, Garth Edwards said that he is going to be doing the next Godzilla movie and that he that those three monsters will appear in the next American Godzilla movie. It's just that the movie's not coming out until what, two thousand eighteen, I think, because he has to go off and make one of the Star Wars spin off movies. Yeah. So we have to wait quite a long time. But we're waiting for such a long time that now Toho, the creators of Godzilla have said that now that America has made such a good Godzilla movie, we're in the unfortunate position where we have to make a Godzilla movie better than America. So they've put a big, massive team of writers and producers and stuff together to try and top the American version. So they're making another Godzilla movie, which is coming out in like two or three years, before the next American Godzilla movie. So it's a very exciting time to be a Godzilla fan. That is that yeah that is interesting. I, I you know Toho throws it back into it you know because most of them are really pretty cheap and you know not much yeah. to them um, you know but to see them like okay let's let's do a fucking Godzilla movie now you know yeah that could be pretty it's awesome. interesting. Final Wars was pretty good. It was a pretty good movie. Yeah, I found it odd that they shows they 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 chose one specific American song to be the theme for the movie. They picked a song called We're All to Blame by Some Forty One. Okay. And it's played a couple it's played a couple of times throughout the movie. And it, they even gave Some Forty One credit, like music by Some Forty One in the opening credits, when, in fact, they just got one song by Sum 41, and they made it kind of the theme to the movie. But what's weird about that is that that song by Sum 41 is all about 9-11. Okay. The song is basically, hey, do you want to know why 9-11 happened? It happened because we're all to blame, because America's fucking evil, and we deserve that. That's basically what the song is about. That's basically what the entire song is about. So it's weird that of all the songs for Toho to pick to be the theme for a Godzilla movie, they picked the one mo- the one song 
about how America deserved the 9/11. Yeah. It's it, it's really kind of I love the song, but still it's a bit odd. Mm-hmm. A bit weird. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, and it's it's hard to it's hard to tell why. That's that's what makes Japanese and Japanese culture so interesting. Like, why would they pick that? Why do they do that? <laughs> you know. It's like Western culture skewed. Just a couple of centimeters, you know. Yeah. The Japanese culture. So, um, what did you think of the movie? Did you get a chance to see the movie? Uh, you mean this week's movie, 1983? That's bulletin. Yes, because 9/11 leads right into that. It does kind of lead into that because part of this week's movie. There were I I I had some 9/11 flashbacks watching this movie because it was a fairly good representation of a live news broadcast of some sort of a tragedy. Mm-hmm. And they got a fairly good cast and a lot of people that kind of went on, but I'm pretty sure that nobody knew them. At Time, I think they made a special because I saw this first run. I'm pretty sure it was NBC. I'm not sure about what channel it was. It was NBC. It was kind of like a Vent TV, you know? Yeah. Where that all played out in one night for like three hours or whatever with commercials and shit. And I have not seen many stories that are put out that way. You know, in a there was another. Realistic. There was another movie that came out this, this same year, 1983, that was like this, and it was called The Day After. It was another made-for-TV movie. It was made by ABC, and it had an all-star cast. I think Steve Gutenberg was in it, but it was all about a, a fake news broadcast because America was going to nuclear war with Russia. Yeah, the day after wasn't exactly that same style, though. And that yeah. is on YouTube. <laughs> you know? The day um, after? The day after, yeah. Uh-huh. With Jason Robards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, God, what's the fucking face? Uh, Police Academy, Steve Gutenberg. Yeah, Steve Gutenberg. Uh, yeah, a couple of other, couple of other not so yet famous names. Well, you know who was in a special bulletin that I was surprised of? Uh, Michael Madsen's in this. Yes. (laughs) I was so shocked by that. And I'm like, wait a second, is that fucking Mr. Blonde right there? Is that, is that, that can't be Mr. Blonde. And then he opened his stupid mouth and I'm like, holy crap, that's, that's Kill Bill right there. Must have been like freaking 19 or, Plenty, but man, I was totally him. I was blown away because I had just recently seen like Kill Bill and Kill Bill Two again, and he has that wonderful line and that bizarre, drunken way that he speaks. Yeah, in fact, he almost looked uh, sober in this movie, which was weird. <laughs> and he only had like two or three lines, but still. Um, so special bulletin. It was a 1983 made-for-TV movie. The writer-director team who created this made-for-TV movie later went on to do 30-something, the TV show, which I never saw, but that I heard was popular, and um, My So-Called Life. You ever yeah. seen My So-Called Life? I haven't really seen either one of those shows. They were just both pretty big as far as I know. My so-called life had Claire Danes in it, and for, like, a, a, there was a period in time when MTV would just play it 24-7. It was, like, the My yeah. So-Called Life channel, 24-7 episodes <laughs> of My So-Called Life. It was really weird. But uh, the movie was directed by Edward Zawick. That was the guy who directed Special Bulletin. And 
And that's a name I know because he directed a whole bunch of movies in the 90s, and he's still making movies. He did Glory with Matthew Broderick. Okay, which one? Glory with Matthew Broderick and Glory, uh, okay. Denzel Morgan Washington Freeman. and yeah. Morgan Freeman. Yeah, he made that yeah. movie, and that movie's freaking wonderful. He did Legends of the Fall with Brad Pitt. Yeah. And one of the one of his more recent movies in 2010, he did the movie Love and Other Drugs, which is a wonderful movie because it features Anne Hathaway nude a lot. Yeah, <laughs> right. like fully nude throughout the entire movie. So I really am a big fan of Edward the Wick. It's called production value, <laughs> right? So, the, so the two main people in this is so that it's a. It's a very realistic live broadcast of a tragedy, and these people have taken hold of a nuclear weapon. Say it, and say it. it. Nu- nuclear vessel. <laughs> yeah, nuclear vessel. The two main anchors who are covering this, I like the guy, John Woodley, but in the beginning, he's... he's in the beginning, he's called the Dean of RBS News. What the fuck does that mean? The Dean of RBS News? Yeah, in the beginning, he's a... We are joined here by John Woodley, the Dean of RBS News. Is this fucking Hogwarts, or is is this a, <laughs> is this a college or something? Is he going to put, like, a, is he going to put the Animal House people on double secret probation or something? Because I don't know what the dean of a new show is. It's kind of hard to tell, though, now. Um, but at the time, that was pretty indistinguishable from anything going on on television with their logos and their lights and yeah. you know, stars. I liked, I liked in the beginning there was that little commercial for other programming on RBS before they went live. I wanted more of that. Mm-hmm. The game show. I wanted more of... Yeah. I wanted yeah, more had, of... It had a RoboCop vibe, almost. Yeah. You know, RoboCop you know or... Um, uh, this is going on on the side. Yeah, I was also thinking of uh, The Running Man. The Running Man. When yeah. They would, yeah, when they would show commercials for the other shows that are on the air. Mm-hmm. I did not like the girl reporter. Susan Miles. She was the head anchor. She was way too quiet, and she yeah. allowed way too much dead air to happen. I've seen a lot of tragedies unfold on the news, and I know that they would not allow that much silence to happen. <laughs> they would be constantly saying, "Okay, if you're just if you're just joining us, if you're just tuning in." But she was just she was going for that. She was going for the drama, so she allowed yeah. a lot of well. Yeah. I think we all and, just and saw. Frankly, frankly, that was, something I was, that was something I was seeing on the news when 9-11 was happening, and it was really getting on my fucking nerves. Every goddamn anchor that got on television, they were trying to do, like, the Hindberg, the Hindberg speech. Yeah. You know? Like, everybody was, was, like, comically stupid trying to do, like, the one report that will sum up 9-11 that people will watch this report for years to come. Yeah. You know, like like that or the eagle has landed or when they shot Kennedy or, you know, any of that. It would be, yeah. It would be them. They made that report. And that's, mm-hmm. that's what they were coming off a lot like. Yeah. Yeah. I did like uh, the the old guy who was in Washington, Morton Saunders in Washington. Yeah. I liked yeah. him because he's a huge character actor. He was in My Cousin Vinny. He was in Red Dawn. He was in The Mighty Ducks. He was in a couple episodes of Weeds, the TV show, too. I forget who the actual actor is who played Morton Saunders in Washington, but he's just one of those character actor guys who's been in everything. i got to find out. 
But but there were three people out of out of the uh, the the people who actually took the nuclear warhead. There were three people who who were in my mind fairly famous. First off, the leader of the yeah terrorist uh-huh. guy, Bruce Lyman. He was in the thing. Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, he was the pilot. He was the other pilot. Yeah, David Clennon is the actor's name. And then uh, the the black female Frida Barton. She was oh, played oh, by the God. singer. She was played by the singer actress Rosalind Cash. She was in Omega Man with. Uh, she was the. Uh, Shot from the Omega Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When they put up she a was, still was, picture. Uh-huh. Yeah, she was the love interest for freaking Chucky Heston. But then I, I, I wasn't and she sure if there was a performance in this too. Yes, yes. She really did a good fucking job. But it, it took a while for me to to figure this out. But the uh, the doctor David McKeeson, the doctor with the big facial hair and the beard and all of that is the yeah, one who familiar, but I, couldn't I figured out who he is I figured out who he is he, got, he was Sledgehammer he was what? Sledgehammer you remember the TV show, uh, show Sledgehammer from 1986? yeah very short run yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. he was also in a Burn After Reading he was in the Last Men in Black movie he's been in a bunch of shit yeah. Uh, David Rash, R A S C H E. He was he's a he was a he's a big name. He's still acting today, but I wasn't sure if that was him. But eventually, just I saw it in his eyes, and I'm like, holy crap, that's Sledgehammer! I loved that show when I was a kid. Yeah. Sledgehammer. I can I can swear it only ran maybe 13 episodes. I don't even know if it lasted out a season. Yeah. You know, I know uh, Police Squad, which Naked Gun came from, which I loved the show, didn't like the movies very much. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. only, had, didn't like it only ran for like 13 episodes. Yeah. You know? And they both had some very, uh, um, oh, okay. have you seen the movie Rockslide? With, uh, have I seen Warburton? Have I seen what? The movie is called Rock Slide. Was on Netflix. Not sure if it is anymore. Oh, you well, know what? It was on my over. queue, but I never saw it. It was on my queue, it, but I never saw it. Yeah. It has very much the same kind of flavor. Yeah. As Sledgehammer. Yeah. Oh well. I might have to check that out. Yeah. yeah. Um, 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 so he was um, dying of radiation poisoning from having created the bomb in his basement. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Sledgehammer. But what? the whole style I found very interesting. And again, at the time, I mean, it is dated as all kinds of fuck. Yeah, know, it is. But, but in the head anchor time, looked very much like a the head anchor looked very much like she was from the movie Working Girl. Yeah. They okay. really had to put up that disclaimer because uh, I could see people having bought into that as a real news story. Well, you know, I, have a, very, uh, I have a... I have a... lot of stuff with that time. I have a story to go with this. Oh, yes, you do. Go for it. Uh, okay. So every year, my family would all get together and we would go on a big road trip vacation. Almost every year, we would go to Vegas. But this is oh. 80s Vegas. It wasn't family-friendly Vegas. It, it was, was still pretty... It was Vegas. Yeah. It was, it was still nasty Vegas. It was still... I'm a eight-year-old kid walking down the sidewalk, and I'm getting handed pamphlets for prostitutes, mm. Vegas. It wasn't a good Vegas. I mean, the circus, circus, that was okay, but everything else was just horrible and seedy and really, really bad. And there weren't too many like mega casinos with things. 
I became intimately familiar with every arcade in every casino. Yeah. But there's not so much, there's only so much that you can do with, with kids, and it was me and my older brother. So late in the afternoon, we would go back to the hotel, and my brother and I were allowed to order whatever we wanted from room service. And my parents would get ready, and they would leave us in the room all night. Well, they went out and did whatever the hell they wanted. And so, so are you trying yeah. to tell me Quentin Tarantino was ripping you off with uh, four rooms? The Antonio Bandera pretty much. Segment? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. But one year, my brother. Uh, he was allowed to. I've seen, to, I've seen to, pictures of your father. He could pull off gangster. Yeah, yeah. He could do it. I, I was I'm so much. Cool. I was so much browner when I was a kid too. Like I, like I, I was so dark. I could have been like a like a boy from the streets of Calcutta when I was a kid, because yeah. that's how like dark brown I was. I was insanely. I, w- I have I have rich Corinthian leather skin. <laughs> I I have whitened up considerably since when I was a kid, just the darkest kid in the freaking world. I was an almond. But one year, and I would say I was around eight or nine at this, maybe maybe ten at the oldest. But my brother got to spend the week at a friend's house. So it was just me and my parents. So just like all the other times when my older brother was there, you know, late in the afternoon, I was dropped off at the hotel room. I could order whatever I wanted from room service. I was left alone in a hotel room in Las Vegas while my parents went out and did whatever the fuck they wanted. See, aren't you glad you had the hooker pants with then? Right? I, I was happy at the time. I was jumping on the beds. And I was eating a whole bunch of junk food and french fries and hamburgers. And I had a bunch of candy. And I had cable. And I could watch whatever I wanted. And so I turned on the TV. And the first thing I see is a broadcast about how Russia's about to bomb us. Oh, okay. And I freak the fuck out. Now, <laughs> it. It wasn't a special bulletin, and I'm pretty sure it wasn't the day after, but it was definitely some sort of a movie like this. There are a lot of them. Uh, was I know. Was it more action-y or more drama-y? No, it was more just some guy in a studio. There wasn't a lot of... It, there were some really? cuts, but it was... It was it, most of it was just a guy in a studio, and he was just trying to, you know, he would occasionally cut to some report, and and then it would be mostly stock footage. But it was realistic enough that I remember crying. I remember being alone in a hotel room and thinking, the bombs are going to come. This guy's saying that war is imminent. The bombs are about to fall. I'm without my parents. What am I going to do? Is this going to happen soon? And there was like a countdown to when the bombs are going to fall. And I'm just panicking and freaking the fuck out. And I'm and I'm in tears because I think I'm going to die or my parents are going to die while I'm here in the hotel room. And I remember eventually trying to, like, think this out logically. Okay, let me see what the other stations are showing. Okay, there's nothing on any of the other stations. But still, I'm a paranoid kid, so I'm like, okay, well, maybe the other stations just haven't figured out that we're about to die yet. Maybe the other stations haven't. So then I go, well, let me look outside, because, of course, there'll be chaos outside, and everything's just regular Vegas. But then, of course, because I'm a paranoid kid, I'm like, oh, well, maybe these people don't know. Maybe I should open the window up and start yelling to them about how the bombs are about to fall and we're all going to die because Russia is going to kill us. <laughs> but I remember being scared and freaked out and saying, like, I'm going to stay. Will I ever see my parents again? Because I'm so scared. Mm-hmm. Well, my, my parents, my parents, they're from Mexico. They're very old school. Parents, they never fully got me. 
my brother was, he's older and he's bigger and he's stronger and he played sports and my parents had no problems with him. But I was always, I, I was shorter and skinnier and I cried all the time and I loved bad movies and my parents just, they never fully understood me. So I remember just passing out in front of the TV all scared. And when I woke up the next morning and my parents were alive, I was so happy. And I'm like, oh, my God, you guys are alive. Let me hug you. I'm so, I was so scared. I was watching TV last night and they said that the bombs were going to fall and that Russia was going to kill us. And I was so scared because I wasn't going to. My parents didn't care. They were just, oh, really? That's wonderful. Okay, so what are we doing today? Are we going to go to Caesar's Palace or what are we doing? They just kind of blew it off. Yeah. But now think of this, okay? Because me personally, I would consider that one of those life-changing events. That's a big event in a young life, okay? It is. One click, this point in destiny, okay? This fixed point in time and space where you were afraid of the Russians coming to kill us. One click of the remote, pity. Uh, uh, it, it, it had the potential to change your entire life. Oh, no, 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 no. The part that I didn't mention, and that I might as well mention, because I don't think my my mother or father or brother will ever actually care enough to listen to this podcast, because I don't, I don't think they, they they care about me that much, but most of the time, my brother and I would be left at the hotel, and then my parents would go off and do their own thing, and then my brother would immediately force me to go to bed so that he could buy porn on the, uh, the what was it called? Uh, those, those hotel room... Uh, boxes back then, Spectravision. Okay. He would buy porn on the Spectra. Yeah. Yeah. He would buy porn on the Spectravision. He was four years older than me, so he was already like 12, 13 years old at this time. So he would buy porn and watch the porn, and then I would just close my eyes and put my fingers in my ears, and it never opened my eyes and just hope to God that I fall asleep soon. And then when we were leaving the hotel, my dad, who you always never, had... You never you never snuck into the other room to see if he was Jack Mel? Oh, no, it was the same room. Oh, that's, what same made room. This, okay. that's what made this such a scarring, scarring event. Uh-huh. So my my brother was the oldest brother, the, the, the firstborn son, and in the world of Mexicanism, that's a that's a pretty big deal. That's a like a high position to have because you're, you, and then that's why a lot of the firstborn sons they are named directly after the father, and that's a, a thing of pride to have your son named after you because they will carry on your name long after you're gone and yada yada yada. So my brother got away with a lot of stuff which is evident by the fact that after vacation, when my dad would go down and pay the bill, he would say, wait a second, there are some movies here that I did not pay for. What is uh, Best Butts in the West 3? And he would look at us and go, which one of you two did this? And I would be like, are you serious? I'm seven. I like (laughs) Alf. And Alvin and the Chipmunks. And my brother would just go, well, I don't know who did it either. And then my dad would go, well, I don't trust either of you. I think you both did this. I don't think either one of you can be to blame. I'll just blame the both of you and forget about it. And that would just be repeated year after year after year, except for the one year that it didn't happen but I honestly thought I was going to die of a nuclear bomb. Yeah. <laughs> Vegas was a crap hole until I turned 21. Yeah. I avoided it like the plague. But when I came back when I was 21, oh, man, that was wonderful. Okay, we're, 
we're going to run on a tangent here, but I have a related story. <laughs> okay. Because I've never been to Vegas, but uh, I've been to Atlantic City a few times. I have been to Atlantic City. Little Vegas. <laughs> it's from uh-huh. Vegas. <laughs> So, uh, it was like popular in the area. If you, if you belong to any kind of group or whatever or anything like that, you can get a discounted bus ride okay. to, to Atlantic City and like ten dollars and quarters and shit like that. Uh, and I'm not really into gambling. And my wife at the time, well, she was just a drag. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um. So we're we're not. Gambling. I already used up all my quarters, which I do in the slot machines as quick as possible. Yeah. Trying to be like, I gamble. I'm done. So we're walking around the boardwalk, and uh, they're uh, handing out flyers for timeshares, you know? And it's like, yeah. you free gifts and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I'm like, well, that sounds like a goofy thing to do. See, that's why I love Jeannie, who I'm with now so much. I mean, she would be totally fucking down with it. She's like, there's a bus over there going somewhere. They're going to give us a gift. <laughs> Let's get on it. <laughs> <laughs> so we go. And it's an interesting deal, but, like, I don't have money. I don't have money for anything. Like, I took a bus to Atlantic City. This is my big fucking vacation, okay? <laughs> yeah. You're not telling me it's timeshare. No matter what you promise, you, you know, you can promise me a blowjob. You're not selling a timeshare. I don't have the money. So anyway, uh, this guy, Sergeant, he shows us around. He explains the whole timeshare and all that, la, la, la. Shows us the rooms. <clears throat> yeah, they're pretty enough, all that kind of stuff. And then he takes us to the negotiating room, which is like a pit of these people. You know? Yes. It's just circular, small circular tables with cloths on them and contracts. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it, and agents, you know, with people just like us as they bust in. Okay? Yeah. So anyway, we tell them no three or five times or whatever else. And he's like, okay, I, you know, I got to check on my boss. Okay. <laughs> what, what, what's he going to say? <laughs> um, and then he comes back and he's like, my boss just wants to talk to you for a minute. And I'm like, all right. Oh, God. You know, this is a, this is a, you know, they do this in real estate. They do, they do this in car dealerships and shit like that. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's the same kind of thing. Except they bring me upstairs, and this is penthouse suite, okay? The doors, the huge fucking double doors, open into this whole other world, okay? Hmm, yeah. This room has an echo, (laughs) okay? And I go in. The doors close behind me, and I turn around and I look back at the doors. And there are goons at the door. (laughs) Oh, God. I seen this. I know this. I am fucking terrified. And I turn back around, heading to the boss, who is this really kind of a little guy, you know? But he is putting on such the mafia act, he's doing the chin thing like Marlon Brando, you know, scratching under his chin with his fingers and shit. He's like, hey, how's your day? How's it going today? It's going good today. It's Atlantic City. Yeah, it's nice here. Yeah, I just flew in from Vegas. I'm kind of tired, but, you know, I just wanted to have you up here for a second. I think she's your sergeant's doing his job right. Yeah. And there is all kinds of shit. There's all kind of shit in my pants. <laughs> my, yeah. my my wife, who is Swiss, has no idea what's going on. So you know, I'm just I'm just trying to get through this conversation. And again, I've grown up in a couple a couple of mafia neighborhoods. Um, well, I 
very simple how to use in the city. So there are a lot of Jewish people, mafia, all, all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, like, the one thing I know about them is that they really respect the working man, you know, and they tend not to fuck with them. So I was just like, I can't afford this shit, man. It's, you know, it's great. It's nice. Yeah, so he did a great job, but I just can't afford this shit. And we talked about that for a while, and he was like, yeah, all right. Go, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Have a good day. There's some right. prizes or something for you, right? Yeah, yeah. Go get, go get, go get him a prize. <laughs> and I'm walking out of this place. It's like, you got to get the prize. If you don't get the prize, you'll be mad. <laughs> Jesus. And they'll call me back. They'll be like, well, you don't like the prizes? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. And, and it was this cheap camera. <laughs> really just cheap plastic camera. Yeah. It probably didn't even work. But I was just like I was just like, man, I'm glad I lived that I don't want <laughs> Right. It doesn't have anything to do with special bulletin, but it played into your Russian gonna kill us all story. E- e- yeah. Yeah, well, there there were parts of watching Special Bulletin that really did kind of get me nervous and anxious. Like when you yeah. mentioned when you mentioned this movie in the last podcast, the first thing I thought of was, "Holy shit, is this going to be that movie that I saw in a Las Vegas hotel room?" Because if it is, then I'm oh, going to do it. Thankfully, yeah. it wasn't that it wasn't because the last one specifically did so it, it was something completely different. But yeah. it did have that vibe. It was definitely of that time period. And, uh, yeah, there were parts of Special Bulletin that just got me on edge a little bit, especially at the end when the shit actually started hitting the fan. There were parts yeah. of it that were like, okay, yeah, if I had watched this movie when I was a kid, if I had watched it when it actually showed up on air, yeah, I might have I might have crapped myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But it was and good. They, it was it was a surprisingly good movie. And they tried to play it even handed, or at least fairly even. I mean, it kind of had a liberal bent to it, I guess. You know, but for the most part, they were not portraying these guys necessarily as heroes. Although yeah. they weren't really villainizing them as much as I kind of thought they should. You yeah. Know? Like, no, hey, they, uh, yeah, they, they protesting to the extreme, dude. <laughs> yeah, they they weren't good guys. They weren't bad guys, and they they made a point of kind of turning it against the 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 reporters too, which I like. Yeah, it was it was a surprisingly good movie. It was one of those ones where I was like, hey. Natasha, maybe you should sit down and watch this. You might actually like this. This is surprisingly. It was a surprisingly tense movie. It took a while for it to get going, but it was a surprisingly tense film. Yeah. For a and, 1983 yeah, made-for-TV movie. Yeah, and it had, like, a lot of good people in it. You know, they really hired the people that could do the job, you know? Yeah. So even if they were fairly unknown at the time, you know, but um, but yeah, I like I like the whole style of it. I like the tension. I like the idea, at least, that this could be happening right now. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and it did very much have a nine eleven vibe to it, where you were like, okay, what the fuck is going on now? You know. Yeah. Especially with the whole idea of them bumbling the uh, evacuation, I felt that that yeah. was realistic. Especially I, given I, our government. Yeah, I kind of had some problems with that. That very kind of reason that that like, really, man, you you know how many people are in the town? You should be able to figure out how many fucking blankets you need. Yeah. You know. So I was like, how the fuck did this happen? But you know, the thing is, is that we hear that all the time. You know, I mean, that was fucking Katrina in a big goddamn way. You know? <clears throat> Just like wow, we don't we don't know what to do with you. 
here. It's been here for a while. Hurricane Katrina. I... Whenever I whenever I think of Hurricane Katrina, I think of a red cup and I start laughing, which is a bad reaction to such a hideous <laughs> tragedy. But it, there was an article about Sean Penn that was shortly after Hurricane Katrina because apparently Sean Penn took it upon himself to not tell reporters or not tell news people. He just got a boat and a, a motor and just was going from house to house trying to save people. Because, really? And he, yeah, and he just did it because he's he's a good guy, and I think he's trying to make up for his past sins of in the 80s when he was dating Madonna and he was a fucking asshole. But he's I literally just... gotten over. <laughs> no. But but he, he, he got a boat, and he was just saving people, and that's all that he was doing was trying to help people out. And there's a photograph that they showed in Rolling Stone where... There was someone floating in the water, and he was kind of like trying to save them, but in his hand was a red Solo cup in Sean Penn's hand. In Sean Penn's hand, he's reaching out to save this person while also holding a red Solo cup. And for some reason, in my hand, I just painted the adventures of Sean Penn and his red Solo cup going from disaster to disaster, helping people with his magical red solo cup. But and now, I, just pictured, I just pictured 9-11 happening, but then there's Sean Penn and there's his cup. And he's got his is, cup and his cup's going to save everything. There's also a psychological reaction to that, too, because every time you see a red solo cup in a movie, it indicates that there's alcohol or something in that cup. Yeah. That's just like but a now, strange little movie convention. Yeah. But now, Sean Penn has to save the day with his red solo cup. <laughs> because it's magic. I think aliens gave it to him, like Hayata, and his beta capsule transforms into Ultraman. So, do you, he, do you think he's got to put on a costume and kneel in front of it every now night and say, like, a chant? Maybe, maybe like a Green Lantern and his his uh his ring. This yeah. is Sean Penn and his cup, and it's magical. And he just Don't he goes from town to town helping people now with his magical cup. Thou shalt not punch a paparazzi. Thou shalt not marry Madonna. <laughs> Freaking Madonna. I make fun of Madonna. I make fun of Madonna all the time. Like we're watching some movie and some monster shows up, and I'm like, "Oh God, it's Madonna!" I didn't know Madonna was in this movie. And like I, some I, character I, vomits, and I go, "Oh my God, he must have just heard a Madonna album." And my 13 year old daughter, she said, "I don't know who Madonna is." And I turned around and I'm like, "Really?" And she and she said, "Yeah, I mean, I I don't really know who she is. I just know that she's famous and that apparently she's horrible because you hate her so much." And I just I envy her it's, it's because like she doesn't know who Madonna is. Willow. Yeah, yeah. I told her. Yeah. I said, if you want to know who Madonna is, Madonna is the most important person in the world according to Madonna. <laughs> I remember. And that's when all Madonna you need was... to know. I remember when Madonna was first coming out, I was like, oh, this chick is just going to be another flash in the pan. You know, the songs are okay, but not very interesting and everything. And after all these years, I'm still expecting her to be a flash in the pan. Yeah. I just wish she would hurry. Right? But hopefully she's getting close there. I hate Madonna so much. <laughs> Wait, what'd you say, Nassau? No, I don't hate McDonald's. I hate Madonna. I like McDonald's. Do you like McDonald's? Yeah. Okay, Maxwell likes McDonald's. Yeah. You heard it here first. Maxwell likes McDonald's. Yeah. Wait, hold on a second. Say, I love McDonald's. I love McDonald's. There you go. Don't, don't make That's an that. exclusive. Not they're paying a fucking endorsement. They got right. the money. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Right. But, okay. Yeah. Um, 
So what are you thinking about next week? Any ideas there? Uh, next week. Next week. I kind of want to do some something big and fairly new. I I I I like the movies that we focus on, but I don't want this to just be like. What weird, bizarre movie are we going to do this week? Yeah. Like, I like the episode where we did Hot Rod, because that was a that was a fairly... Even that one's like a weird one, but that came out recently by a major studio somehow who actually thought that the movie would be successful, but I don't well, know. This one, this one I view more as like a find, you know? Right. This, this definitely is. buried out there, yeah. Yeah, what do you think about What do you think about Guardians of the Galaxy? Oh, I am so down. We could do that. We could do that I mean, we've mentioned it a bajillion now. times. We've mentioned it a bajillion times, number one. And number two, I think this would be a good time to talk about not just Guardians of the Galaxy, but other superhero movies. I feel like if we watch this, we could talk about Batman. We could talk about Green Lantern. We could talk about Wolverine in finger quotes. I, I'm down with that. I think that's a good idea. All right. Cool. Next week, Guardians of the Galaxy. All right. Uh, any homework assignments? Mm, I thought, I thought of a homework assignment. It's not TV related, but I still think it's a pretty good homework assignment. It's it's nothing like uh, destroy it's, a piece it, of modern art and a gourmet coffee bar. Nothing like no, that. this it's, isn't like a like a Fight Club homework assignment. <laughs> no, okay. I thought um, a look back in Angora. I think I have that. It's on YouTube. It's less than an hour long, but. I like the movie Ed Wood, the Tim Burton movie with Johnny Depp, because it does a good job of explaining the basics of who Ed Wood was and the movies that he made, and it gives you a good idea about his essence and why it's Im- he's important. But it also contains a bajillion factual errors, uh-huh. because the movie Ed Wood is based on the book Nightmare of Ecstasy, and that book is a series of interviews of people who who worked with Ed Wood being interviewed years and years after they worked with Ed Wood. So it, Ed Wood is a movie based on a book based, and the book is just a series of random interviews with people. So the movie shows a bunch of things to be facts when those facts just come from some interview with a guy talking about something that happened to him 50 years ago. Right. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So I yeah. think oh, that yeah. so so the the documentary Ed Wood a look back in Angora that does a better job of explaining the details of Ed Wood's life. Yeah, of, it does. The of ups who and he is. And... Yeah, it's short, but it does a better job of explaining Ed Wood's importance, and I really, really like that. Yeah. And it's it's on YouTube, it's free, it's all over the place and it, I I think it's a good a good thing for people to watch to kind of understand Ed Wood. It's kind of like the Ed Wood cliff note. Cool. So look back in Angora. It is on my YouTube page in the B movie section. So you can find it there. at least it was the last time I looked. And that's the problem with running a a playlist like that. Is yeah. That YouTube, as soon as they find something, if it's not in the public domain, bang, it's gone. <laughs> yeah. Know? So I have to keep looking through the list. I'm like, oh, deleted, deleted. I am so deleted. I am I so, so surprised that I am so surprised that the Showtime nudity filled movie, The Death Artist, is still up on my YouTube page. Yeah. Because it, I'm I'm just surprised. I'm just deeply surprised. I'm like, okay, this is going to last. 
it's going to last for like a couple of days and then it's going to disappear. But it's still there, and I'm so happy because it's just a piece of brilliant art. And you know, and it's it's one of those strange things. Like, do we watch that and say, "Oh, it's great," and shout it from the rooftop so people go and watch it a lot, and then YouTube pulls it? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. We're just odd. quiet about it so it will stay. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like that. <laughs> so next week, Everybody, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, and your homework assignment is to watch a look back in Angora, which is on YouTube, or go to Bunny's YouTube, Undead Cow. Uh, let's see. I wrote a whole little spiel. Uh, let's see. We are in the iTunes store and on Stitcher. Find us on Facebook. Just search for the Pope on Film. Follow us on Twitter at Pope on Film or email us at Pope at UndeadCow.com. Check us out on YouTube by searching forward slash users forward slash Undead Cow Film. Or find all, find all of our shows on our website, UndeadCow.com. Also, I, ha- I, I do... Everything. Yeah. Also, I do story times for kids. I've been doing story time for bizarre, loud, crazy story times for kids. Um, I've been doing them once a week for over 10 years. And I have a Facebook page now for my story times. It's called Story Times with Mr. Steve. And I set it up, and somehow it's gotten 130 likes. Like, it's exploded. And I want it to explode more, so uh, do me a favor and find my story times. My story times are really great. I'm doing things with story times that no one else would ever do. Like, the other day I said, kids, I've got these books that I'm supposed to read to you, but they're a bit too childish. They're a bit too babyish. And I know that you kids want something more grown up. That's why I'm going to be reading this book to you. It's by Stephen King, and it's called The Stand. Now, as you can see, this is a huge book. It's going to take about five days to read, so get comfy. And whatever you do, don't boo. I might lose my place and have to read one of these silly little kids' books, and you don't want that, right? Of course you don't. So, let's start reading Stephen King's The Stand, and... Sometimes I'll pick some, like, right-wing book. Like, sometimes I'll try and read a Bill O'Reilly book or something like that to the kids. Just to mess with them. I just have, I just have, I just, it it brings me a lot of joy to mess with kids during story time. So, if you could find my Facebook page and like it, uh, I would greatly appreciate that. It's uh, Story Times with Mr. Steve. So, find my Story Time page and like it. I will get that into our group. Sweet. Awesome. Can't wait to talk about Guardians of the Galaxy next week. I mean, we've already yeah. mentioned it. We've already mentioned it pretty much in almost every episode of this podcast, so might as well just bite the bullet and do it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we watched it pretty much on the loop uh, Saturday. Yeah. Like, all day Saturday, it just kept playing. <laughs> uh, hold on a second. I got my my son here, Maxwell. What does Groot say? I am Groot. Very good, Maxwell. I am Groot. He can't say it perfectly because he's got a Luden's cough drop in his mouth. Aha! Uh-huh. He doesn't have a sore throat. He just thinks it's candy, which it is. <laughs> you ever have a Luden's cough drop? They're tasty as shit. It is. Were those those rubbery ones, or were those the Fine Brothers? I am too. I think those are the the Fine Brothers. The Luden's ones were the ones that just tasted like, like, like cherry candy. Hold on a second. What do you want to say, Maxwell? 